What's up, guys? Welcome into another episode of the Wolverine Live Recruiting Show. I'm your host, EJ Holland. Alongside me is my co-host, Zach Libby. We have not been around, so apologies. And this isn't the live show. This is just a premiere, so we can't answer your questions or anything like that. We've actually been on the road a ton over the last couple of weeks. It is the spring evaluation period, so just housekeeping items. Uh, we will be or I will be continuing to travel this week. Zach will be going on uh, vacation as he had a uh, planned bachelor's party, and he's apparently the leader of this. So he has to take a vacation. <laughs> um, who, by the way, this guy like who Zach's friends with scheduled this bachelor's party during the spring eval period and then turned around and scheduled his wedding during the USC weekend. So... That's a that's a terrible friend right there. He should just, you know, Zach should have dumped him a long time ago. But anyway, um, we'll probably have to keep premiering shows um, every now and then until the end of May. And then we'll get back on our normal schedule um, at the beginning of June. So just really hectic with all the travel and uh, Zach going on his trip out west with his uh, friend boys. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and uh, talk about Michigan recruiting. So since we last had our show, the Wolverines picked up a commitment from four-star in-state offensive lineman Avery Gash. Uh, Gash picked Michigan over finalists, Michigan State, Ohio State, and Wisconsin. He is ranked in the top 300 in the industry ranking, a top 20 interior Offensive lineman, Zach, you've been all over the Gash uh, recruitment. You've seen him a number of times. And, uh, yeah, just talk a little bit about what this commitment means for the Wolverines. I think it just shows that when you pitch an offensive lineman to Michigan, more than likely the, that offensive lineman is going to see the realization that development is going to be best done in Ann Arbor, considering not only the fact that your head coach – is a former offensive lineman. He coached the offensive lineman at Michigan, leading Michigan to two Joe Moore awards. And then the guy who succeeds more at the offensive line coach spot played offensive line at Michigan. Um, so not only do you get the leadership of Jerome Moore and Grant Newsom, I mean, for Gash, I mean, he's 45 minutes away from home. He's close to family, his loved ones. But he just got really familiar with – the campus, the program, the facilities, everything that had to do with on and off the field resources, he got an understanding of because of 10 unofficial visits made over the course of 19 months. I mean, this he was on the radar for Michigan as soon as he was a freshman, but you know, he got the offer as a sophomore when he visited for the Penn State game two seasons ago. Last season, he was there at the big house for three game day visits. Um, you know, during that time, Sharon Moore stopped by Avery Gash's game um, as part of like the, you know, when the coaches were on the road during the bye week. And then this offseason, you know, when Sharon Moore got the nod as head coach, Avery Gash was one of his first calls, um, letting him know that, you know, he's going to be recruited by the head coach. And Ultimately, Grant Newsom as well, and you know he played a big role. Newsom did in terms of garnering a bond with Gash that mirrored what Gash had with Moore over the course of several months. And this this pat this off season as well. I mean, three returns to Schembechler Hall for spring camp practices, and then the spring game. It allowed Gash to just see what kind of leadership and co coaching philosophies Newsom has instilled on the offensive line. And then when you look at the offensive line itself, you know, some of those players, including early enrollees like Blake Frazier and Jake Winera, they were able to have a relationship with Gash even before they were enrolled, right? As all of them were recruits. So ultimately, you know, it was, I feel like not just from past successes as offensive line, you know, that Michigan has um, endured over the course of three seasons, but, you know, this is a kid who, you know, cares about his education you know the ross school of business was a um big selling point and then ultimately like i said he's going to be close to home you know he wanted to stay in big 10 country his top four included all big 10 teams but you know to play for a national champion to work towards 
winning another one and then playing on an offensive line that's considered one of the best in the country was, um, you know, the tipping point. So ultimately, Michigan did everything it could and pulled every resources to ensure that Avery Gash didn't go out of state or to Michigan State and then keep him close to home. Um, so Gash's uh, ranking is interesting. It seems like the services don't agree on him um, too much. You have on three that lists him as a three star, and then you have two services that have him inside the 200 to 300 range, and then another one that's inside the top 200. Um, with Gash, I think he's one of the better interior offensive linemen in the country. I think, for example, on three, which has him as a three star is uh is too low and i, I would probably agree with uh, more with espn which has them in that borderline uh top 300 range i think they have them at like 298 or something um but i would have them just outside of the top 300 but as a four-star recruit you know gash is extremely physical and i i don't necessarily put a premium um on straight up into your offensive linemen which was why my um Grade is a little low. You do see him playing some tackle here on his film, um, but I think he's a guard all the way at the next level. But the thing that stands out when you watch uh, Gash's huddle tape, which we're playing here now, is, again, just that physicality. I think he's a guy that knows how to finish blocks, which is always a plus at the high school level. You know, having a guy that has that mean streak, that wants to put guys in the dirt, he certainly has that. He can clean up some things. Uh, from a technical standpoint, he's not overly athletic, but like I said, just really physical road grader that fits uh, what Michigan looks for in its interior offensive linemen. So, you know, Gash was a priority for Sharon Moore when he was the offensive line coach. And obviously, as a head coach, he was personally involved in this recruitment. So he was a guy that was always a tier one recruit for Michigan. They wanted to close with him and they were able to do so earlier than expected now unfortunately for michigan since our last show you know they landed avery gash but they missed out on marquise davis on 300 running back out of ohio picking kentucky over michigan in a bit of a weird turn of events so how this happened was obviously michigan had built a ton of momentum with davis they got him on campus three times in the spring and you saw some um predictions from other sites roll in zach and i never put in predictions because we were kind of told to hold off michigan wanted to take a cautious approach with this recruitment and you know a lot of people ask me what we meant by that why we didn't put in predictions why we were saying that michigan was taking a cautious approach well we found out why <laughs> kentucky came in and obviously i think nil was a big factor in this recruitment. And you see Michigan had the overwhelming lead on the on three recruiting prediction machine, Kentucky with just a 2.7% chance of landing him pulls it off. And I think, you know, this kind of sums up the NIL era where recruitments can turn on a dime or things are really sensitive at a place like Michigan where, you know, there is no NIL for recruits. So, uh, Zach, what was your and and Zach, you were in Ohio, I guess, as this was taking place. What was your reaction to uh, Marquise Davis uh, picking Kentucky over Michigan? I thought it was a fake account when I saw that he picked because I was like, no, no, <laughs> no. I just saw him twelve hours ago. Uh, the, I mean, I guess the reaction. It's like you, you know, history has, per, you know wrote the story in terms of just Kentucky beating out Michigan for recruits, especially in the state of Ohio. This isn't the first time, and I don't know if this will be the last, but in order for it to be the last, I think there's a lot, you know, lessons that you can take away from this, especially on the NIL front. But, you know, this is a tough, tough loss for Michigan, especially considering the fact that they hosted Davis on three unofficial visits this spring, all of them coming following Tony Alfred's hire from Ohio State in March. I mean, you know, he was able to see three spring camp practices. He got to be close with the coaches. I, I, I don't think everyone, I think this was all caught a surprise by everybody. But again, I think what Kentucky can sell 
on the recruiting front, I think you're just seeing, you know, it's able to beat out Michigan for some of these top players. And, you know, we saw it last cycle with two commits flipping to Kentucky. So, I mean, ultimately, I don't see it as a surprise. I think it's just more of a, a learning lesson for how to prevent this from happening moving forward if you're on the Michigan side. Yeah, I think it was a surprise to a lot of fans that, you know, are kind of more casual fans. That's why you should subscribe to the Wolverine.com for one dollar for two months. Um, so, yeah, you should do that. Um, that way you're not caught off surprise. But I think a lot of fans saw the predictions on Twitter and just assumed it was a done deal. And, you know, even for us, it, it seemed like it was there. But, you know, again, we heard that Michigan was taking a, a cautious approach and, that's why, you know, like uh, they obviously were prepared for some type of NIL surprise punch. And it, it happened to be from Kentucky. And, you know, it's it's not anything new. If you're a Michigan fan, you know, this happened last cycle when, you know, Aaron Childs was about to commit to Michigan and they were setting up an ESPN announcement for him. And then he visited Florida and he stopped responding to them and committed to Florida that night. So, you know, it just, it, it's going to happen unless Michigan has some type of NIL plan. It's just, you know, there are certain kids that are going to pick Michigan no matter what. And there are other kids that, you know, just aren't. And that's not, you know, uh, an indictment on Marquise or, or Childs, you know, it's just the way college football works now. So, you know, I think Marquise is a tough loss. Obviously, I was very high on him as a prospect. He was my favorite running back on the board. So, you know, it hurts me personally to see him go to Kentucky, especially a lesser program like Kentucky. Um, and you look at the rest of the running back board, and now Tony Alford has to press the reset button. You have fellow Ohio native Bo Jackson, who uh, did not include Michigan in his top group. Uh, you have Jordan Davison, a uh, on 300 running back from California, who visited and named Michigan in his top four, but that one seems unlikely. So, you know, uh, Alford's dished out some offers to some new running back targets like Todd Robinson. Down in Georgia, there's pre-existing targets like Iverson Howard from the DMV who just visited for the spring game. So it'll be interesting to see if Michigan takes two backs, who they prioritize. You know, I think there uh, are a lot of unanswered questions on that board specifically now that uh, Marquise Davis um, decided to go to Kentucky. You know, he was basically penciled in with an asterisk and now he's completely erased <laughs> because I'm not sure Michigan will be able to get back in the Davis race despite that relationship with Alford because again the NIL uh, part of it is not there so from uh, uh, Davis let's go ahead and move on to our next topic and that is us hitting the road like I said we haven't had our regular show programming mostly because we've been traveling and Zach you just got back from Las Vegas, where you refused to gamble. You were afraid they were going to rip you off. Um, but you did stay at a luxury hotel on the Strip and mostly just slept and went to Bishop Gorman's practice. Uh, so Zach did not really enjoy the city, but he did get to see quite a few Michigan targets. Give us a quick rundown of the uh, Bishop Gorman targets and where you think Michigan stands with them. Yeah, so the first one we got to talk about is top 100 wide receiver Derek Meadows, um, the number seven overall wide receiver in the 25 class. Um, you know, Mich Michigan has five offers to Bishop Gorman kids. Derek is the latest to have visited Ann Arbor, and he did it at the spring game in late April. Um, he has family in the Detroit area, so it was a reunion of sorts. You know, he got to see his grandmother and all that. But, you know, he's familiar with the area, but this was his first time in Ann Arbor on an official visit, and it was good for him to get in, you know, FaceTime with wide receivers coach Ron Bellamy, head coach Jerome Moore. Got to see some of his old youth football teammates from the Naperville Patriots in – um, Tyler Morris and Amarion Stewart. Um, so that was nice for him. But, you know, afterwards, you know, it's, it's, it really solidified, you know, I guess Michigan is a contender for him. Um, the next step is getting him for an official visit. It's something that Michigan is pushing for. And it's obvious considering, you know, if you read my observations piece um, earlier this week, you know, 
the way Derek gets in and out of breaks and just a bigger bodied outside receiver threat, you know, he fits the bill that Michigan is looking for. And he was outstanding in spring practice um, on Tuesday. Uh, you know, he has a few official visits set up already to Alabama, Georgia, Notre Dame, and Tennessee. Um, that means all of his next upcoming weekends are booked. Michigan's obviously trying to get him in for an official visit. That is the next step in terms of ultimately landing him. Um, like I said, a bigger bodied outside receiver threat that Michigan is vying for this cycle. Um, right now, Derek has officials to Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, and Notre Dame. Um, this is in next month. Um, and then he has a he has an idea in which he wants to commit like maybe April could be before that either way, you know, he's looking at dates in terms of which he can find a way to get back for an official to Michigan. Um, you know, Notre Dame has the ultimate lead, but you know, Georgia, Alabama and others are really pushing for uh, Meadows. So it's, it's a, it's a deep list of competition, but you know, that spring game really put Michigan on the map in terms of fighting for the official visit and, you know, being a final contender. The, you know, there is the, among the four others, there are three offensive line targets in the 25 class at Gorman with Michigan offers. All three are expected to end up officiating Michigan. Um, but the one that has one set right now is Eli Kalani Ovalu, four star, uh, versatile guy on the line. He currently plays left tackle for Gorman, um, but you know he has projected ability to play inside as well. Uh, right now, he's you know Michigan has the lead on the RPM. Um, his June official visit to Michigan is scheduled for the fifteenth. He also has upcoming trips to Cal and USC and others. Um, but you know, as I mentioned about Gash, you know this is a, a kid who really, really liked what he saw at the Ohio State game last season when he visited. Um, you know, he went out there for the first time with other teammates at Gorman and. Got to see, you know, meet with Sharon. Um, he's gotten to know Grant Newsom this offseason. The staff was out there um, earlier this week. So, I mean, again, this is a kid who really just appreciates, I guess, the on and off a bit of res amenities, resources that Michigan can provide. And, you know, as a kid who wants to go to the NFL, you've seen how many draft picks Michigan has produced on the offensive line. Um, same thing goes for another, for the two other offensive linemen. First off, we'll start with Douglas Utu, um, the top 100, number three overall interior offensive lineman in the country. Um, six foot three, two, like 300 pounds. He does play right tackle. He, Montre recently moved him to an interior um, trajectory. I, 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 I don't see that being out of the question. Um, I think he can play both. Um, he has a really nice frame, but um, this is a kid who visited in late March. For the first time, you know, Scott to spend the weekend in Ann Arbor with the family, got to see spring camp practice, met with Moore and Newsom, has great relationships with both, um, you know, and talking to people close to him, you know, an official visit to Michigan is in the works. And that's something that they're pushing for. And then the last one, SJ Alofatuli, um, another top 100 projected interior type at the next level. Um, he's, he's one that I could see playing center or guard. Um, he was also with Kalani Ovalu at the Ohio state game in late November. Um, you know, I think seeing 110,000 people in the stands and seeing that great of a game last season really piqued his interest. I think having a relationship with Cheryl Moore that dates back over two years is also has his attention. And again, sure. Grant Newsom has been heavily involved in this one. So I expect, Ala Fatuli to take an official as well. Um, we'll see what date that is, but um, there's other contenders like USC, Nebraska, Miami, Texas A&M, Alabama. You know, all these schools are pushing for all three kids. It'll be interesting to see if Michigan ultimately lands a couple. Um, you know, they have one offensive lineman on the board right now committed, but there's three um, in Gor at Gorman specifically. So um, that they're, they're targeting. So. I mean, whether or not they take one, two, or three, or all, you know, against all of them. So um, it'll be interesting to follow and see where they ultimately land um, because I could see them ultimately committing this summer, um, you know, trying to end their recruitments before the season begins this fall. Awesome. So uh, I was on the East Coast. I've made several stops, but I'm going to highlight 
three recruits. I would say they are the big three as far as, you know, um, top of their respective boards on offense. So let's go ahead and start off with Quincy Porter, top 100 wide receiver out of Bergen Catholic in New Jersey. Obviously, we've talked about Quincy quite a bit. He has uh, three official visits set right now, Michigan, Ohio State, and Oklahoma. It's actually uh, in this order, Ohio State, Michigan, Oklahoma. So OU getting the last visit, but I still think that this one's an Ohio State, Michigan battle. Ohio State was there the day that I was on campus. Uh, Brian Hartline and uh, defensive assistant were both there to see Quincy Porter, the entire Michigan offensive staff was there earlier in the week. So everybody from lead recruiter Ron Bellamy to area recruiter Grant Newsom to new offensive coordinator Kirk Campbell, they all uh, went to the school, met with Porter and his father, and made a really strong impression and locked in his official visit. So like I said, this one feels like more of a Michigan-Ohio State battle with Oklahoma uh, hanging around and you know, you have a few other SEC schools interested as well. Georgia and Alabama were both at Bergen when I was there. So it'll be interesting to see how much they turn up the heat. I think with Ohio State, you have the advantage of selling an offense that passes the ball a ton, uh, quite a bit of wide receiver production, uh, you know, recent NFL draftees like Jackson Smith, Nigba and Garrett Wilson. Um, you have NIL. So that's always helpful. On the Michigan side of things, it's also, you know, you also have a lot to sell. You have an open spot for Porter to come in and potentially start right away. They don't really have that big bodied pass catcher that they've wanted over the last couple of cycles. They haven't been able to land a true elite, a big outside receiver that, you know, is a true red zone threat. And that's exactly what Quincy Porter is. Uh, so the opportunity for immediate playing time is there. And look, we've talked a lot about Michigan's offense being very run heavy, but you need a dynamic playmaker to open up the offense a little bit. And that's kind of the pitch to uh, Quincy. Obviously, Michigan, uh, a superior school on the academic side as well. And, you know, I think even though Michigan hasn't or isn't known as that big pass happy offense like Ohio State, you know, they put wide receivers in the league. You saw two drafted this year in Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson. So, you know, I think Michigan has done really well in this recruitment, that opportunity, like I said, to be a game changer in the offense, to come in and, and potentially start right away. Like I could really envision Porter um, starting or at least making a really big impact as a true freshman, whereas Ohio State obviously recruits you know, high end receivers, multiple high end receivers every cycle, you know, the, the depth chart may be more appealing in Ann Arbor. Ultimately, I feel like this is going to come down to official visits. And I like the fact that Michigan's official visit comes after Ohio State, especially if Ohio State isn't able to um, lock him in while he's on campus. Next guy I'm going to hit on is Andrew Olesh, top 100 tight end out of Pennsylvania. He is the number one target for Michigan on the tight end board. And look, Penn State is considered the heavy leader on the on three recruiting prediction machine, but Michigan's made up a lot of ground lately. Uh, they hosted him for his first unofficial visit this spring. He's locked in to come back for an official visit this summer. And like with Porter, the entire offensive staff went there. So lead recruiter, Steve Casula, area recruiter, Grant Newsom, Kirk Campbell, uh, all went to the school, met with Olesh and both of his parents. And, you know, I think the meeting went extremely well. Um, I had a chance to talk to Olesh, you know, uh, after school on last Friday. And he told me um, that the meeting gave him a lot to think about. You know, they pitched him on being the next Colston Loveland. They talked a lot about tight end production. And obviously those are easy sells uh, for Michigan. You know, he is a Pennsylvania kid. He is in Penn State country. He's like way out there, um, kind of, you know, in the middle of uh, farmland. So, you know, a lot of Penn State influence there. James Franklin has personally been invested in this recruitment. He's been to Penn State a ton, but I think he kind of has that Michigan kid type of vibe. I think he would fit in well with the culture. And like I said, the tight end production just sells itself. So I think if Michigan makes a big impression on him and his family on the official visit this summer, it wouldn't be surprising to see Michigan beat out Penn State. Now, the two schools to keep an eye on outside of Penn State and Michigan 
are Alabama and Florida. Both of those schools um, obviously have a lot to offer and uh, are set to host him for official visits this summer as well. So right now, kind of like Quincy Porter, I see it as a Big Ten battle. With Quincy, it's Michigan, Ohio State. With Olesh, it's Michigan, Penn State. But you have those SEC schools kind of lurking around, so that's something to keep an eye on. Um, next on the list is top 100 offensive lineman Michael Carroll. So like we mentioned earlier, the Wolverines landed Avery Gash. Uh, he has already been recruiting Carroll. You see Penn State has the lead on the on-three recruiting prediction machine, but this one is a Michigan-Alabama battle right now. Penn State uh, has that lead because he's been there quite a bit, and he is a legacy. His father played at Penn State, but Carroll was straight up with me on the record, told me that it is Michigan-Alabama at the top with Georgia and Penn State in that next tier. Now, I would probably give Alabama the slight edge right now, but it is a very, very close race heading into official visits. So like Porter and like Olesh, the entire offensive staff also went over to meet with Carroll. He's built a great bond with Grant Newsom, And I think the Sharon Moore hire probably helped out the most with Carroll out of any other recruits just because, you know, aside from maybe Avery Gash, I think that the relationship that Carol had with Sharon Moore uh, was really special. And that's continued now to have a head coach that has a personal connection with you, I think is very meaningful. And I think Sharon Moore, um, you know, will have a lot to personally sell when he, when Carol makes that official visit in the summer, he's clicked really well with Grant Newsom and, you know, the offensive line, obviously winning two Joe Moore awards over the last three years, having quite a few guys drafted. I think all of that is very, very appealing to Carroll. He's originally from uh, Chicago land. He, his father's from Chicago land. So he kind of has that Chicago type feeling. And obviously Michigan's done very well there pulling guys like JJ McCarthy and Tyler Morris and many others. So, you know, I think that he meshes well at Michigan, but at the same time, you know, Alabama, despite losing Nick Saban is still Alabama. He likes the development there. The strength and conditioning program at Bama was appealing and just their new staff in general has done a really nice job of recruiting Carroll. So again, I would probably give Bama the slight edge, but I think this one is really going to come down to official visits as well. And yeah, I mean, when you look at Porter, top of the board at wide receiver, Olesh, top of the board at tight end, Carroll, top of the board at offensive line, these three East Coast guys are big, big pivotal targets and will really uh, end up shaping the class and the way that Michigan approaches recruiting uh, on the offensive side of the ball moving forward. So curious to see where these guys land. Michi I would say Michigan's in the top two. For all of them, but it, it's going to be you know interesting to see if Michigan can land uh, any of them or all three of them. Uh, the summer is going to really set the stage for that. So that about does it for us, guys. Like I said, we will try to do another premiere at some point in the near future. Um, in the meantime, in between time, like and subscribe. Uh, like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also subscribe to the Wolverine.com for one dollar for two months. And we will see you at some point in the near future.